Okay, guys, welcome back to the channel. Back from Capital Audio Fest, and I'm a little bit under the weather. I caught a cold, not COVID, thankfully. So if I did shake your hands, you can rest assured I did test myself. I don't have COVID. Actually, I've never got COVID, not going wood. But uh, definitely the weather change over there hit me hard. We were sitting outside to eat one night, and it got chilly. Luckily, we moved inside, but it was too late for my sinuses. So I apologize if my voice isn't clear. I'm going to do this off the cuff. Uh, try to get this out because I'm going to just sleep and go to bed for the rest of the day. But I wanted to get a summary recap of the show. And first things first, want to give thanks to all you guys that came up and introduce yourself. Like I said, with this channel, it's all about not just focusing on me and my system and all about me. I like to focus, as you've seen over the years, uh, different people's systems and hear from you guys what you like. And Kudos to you guys for bringing a lot of cool things to my attention. Uh, Rich brought the Bach SP, which I'm going to be talking about shortly. That room, the Theoretic Dynamics with the Jansen Speakers 3D Virtual Engine. Uh, other people have brought things like the Odyssey Room to my attention. Uh, I met a guy, uh, Jim, Dr. Jim from Penn State. He's a subscriber. Uh, friends also with Charles and uh, his friend Steve. These guys have cool systems. And like I do on this channel. I like to feature other people's systems. So hopefully if I did contact you, I mean, everybody I met, I would be interested in doing Zoom interviews with you. I'm very impressed with everybody I met and the level of my subscribers is exactly what I was shooting for in this, uh, when doing on this channel. So I appreciate you guys introducing yourself and you made the show fun for me. And I do also appreciate some of you guys having my back saying, oh, this other guy on YouTube is copying your thing and all this. Thing. Look, guys, I don't care. Um, if I have other fans that are YouTubers, that's cool to me. Um, and I don't own any patents on how I do the channel. So if people want to copy whatever I do, it's fine. Uh, really, everybody on the YouTube is copying Mr. Beast because he's the one slaying it. So people try to do the same things he does. But in my opinion, long term, which you really want to shoot for with a channel, and that's what I try to keep in mind, uh, not only not just make it all about me, but also try to be authentic and try to know what you're talking about or know when you don't know something and bring in those experts to share, share with people. And that helps you much more in the long run than gimmicky, you know, or being a me too type channel so that you don't have embarrassing content a year later that totally contradicts what you say now. So that's what I try to do with this channel and want to give kudos to you guys uh, for supporting me. I did cross the 10,000 subscriber threshold while I was in uh, uh, DC. So thanks a lot for supporting the channel and uh, making the show fun for me. Now, actually talking about YouTubers, I'm going to transition this in a little way. The only YouTuber actually I subscribe to, you guys are going to find this funny, is Audioholics. Not that I don't watch like Danny Ritchie videos. I'll go there manually sometimes and Amir and some other ones if people bring them up to my attention. But one thing about Audioholics that I like, now their show coverage, not too good. They probably should hire me to do their show coverage because that's terrible. But they have really good content on room treatments and they have one good, really good reviewer, Matthew Pose. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it transitions into one of my best of. Let me make sure this is even. I don't want to be crooked. Anyway. Uh, it transitioned to one of my best of the shows. And Matthew was one that reviewed the Polk L800 SDA speaker. And that was a big litmus test for me, seeing how he reviewed it and did a thorough job and really knew what he was doing and saying about it, because I'm familiar with that speaker very much so, versus the other guys that just did very primitive and was very disappointing to be nice. Um, so... Why am I bringing this up? Well, the Polk L800 is a speaker I've always lusted after after hearing it because what it does is try to cancel interaural crosstalk. And what that basically is, if you're not familiar, is everything that comes out of the right speaker that hits your left ear and vice versa is kind of interaural crosstalk and kind of negates true stereo, stereo listening. And so it's just inherent with four standing speakers in a room, you're going to hear with reflections and whatnot, you're your opposite ear is going to hear stuff from the other speaker. And that's why headphone listening is so much different than floor standing in-room listening. But when you can cancel out that interaural crosstalk, and Polk did it in a way with their speakers, they have a cable that shoots out of phase information from the other channel against the wall, and it supposedly cancels it at your listening position. 
but it's a much more primitive way. It's effective. It works. And that's a great speaker. Definitely, even without that technology, that's a great speaker. And that's why I applaud Matthew for both reviewing it with that technology and without. The other guys didn't even do that. I mean, it's embarrassing. But anyway, kudos to him for that. But I've always lusted after that presentation I heard. When it's done right and that SDA worked, that canceling the interall crosstalk is so immersive, so fun, so next century level listening that I want that. And so I came very close to buying those speakers, but it's a little bit difficult with the, all the technology being done in the speaker and how you set it up. It wouldn't be conducive to this room and whatnot. But now Bach SP, Theoretica, Applied Physics, I don't even, I, I should know the name by now, but this guy is extremely impressive. I did see him at Expona. I never got in the sweet spot to get the full experience. And this time I did. And man, this guy is onto something. He's got it now done in the digital domain that cancels the interall crosstalk. A camera watches your head. So when you move your head, you can see it on the app. It's tracking your head, keeps that interall crosstalk uh, from hitting you. And on certain material where you're, it's embedded in the material, some of this is great stereo content. Others, if, there, if it isn't in the content, you're not going to hear that much uh, impressiveness. But... If you can get that true stereo image with some of these recordings, it is incredible. It is next century style stuff. And I know a lot of people, I talked to a few people, actually it was Mikey who said, oh, that's gimmicky or it's, you know, it's trippy, but I don't know if I could do it. But think about it in this way. Here's the deal. If you had always, though, learned how to listen without interall crosstalk, and then you heard the interall crosstalk, you would never go to having that interall crosstalk. It's just that we're so used to listening to floor standards and having that presentation where we have it that when we hear something that is next century level that we don't usually hear or it's more headphone level, uh, then we're like, it's too gimmicky or whatnot. But trust me, guys, <laughs> things are going to move to this level of listening and uh, design versus staying with stereotypical uh, uh, forget the pun there, stereo uh, listening that we've known for ages. And so I was very close to buying this product. The only, and it fits really perfectly. It would actually come right before. He, he knows the Mini DSP very well. I talked to him about it. It would go before the Mini DSP. I would still be able to do everything in the Mini DSP and use the DAC in the Mini DSP or use that one. Anyway, I wanted to, um, but it's $20,000. Uh, show discount was only 10%. And I'm probably going to hold off. I'm still debating it because it's still ev evolving. It's almost like buying a Tesla. I lease my Teslas because it, there's always advancements each three years such that I don't want to have bought this model when there's so many advancements in that three-year window. And then leasing, you, you can get that newer model. I think with this technology, it's really good right now and probably at that point where I would consider buying it, but I want to get a better understanding of how the firmware updates and, you know, am I stuck with that model as he evolves it even more? Uh, I, I need to figure that part out. And then the price point, that's a lot of money, uh, but it's so cool. And you could reimagine listening to all your tracks in a whole different way. Um, it would be cool. And the great thing is if you don't like it on a particular song or whatnot, one button turns it off. And so it's an extremely impressive product. Definitely, if you get to hear that room in the future, make sure you sit in the sweet spot and go through the calibration if you can. So that was probably the most memorable thing at the show, listening to that in terms of next century level stuff that I've never heard before at that level. Uh, but there's tons of other great stuff at the show. And what the theme of this show was, was the fact that these legendary designers like Andrew Jones, Siegfried Linkwitz, Earl Geddes, all had rooms uh, that were inspired by them, uh, their, their designs that resonated with me. And throughout my career as an audiophile, you go to these shows sometimes, and I'll you know, admit that my taste early on was very primitive. I just liked good bass, and I would talk about individual aspects of in these audiophile jargon of things I would look for. And just like I talked about with what we're used to, if you're used to point source box, you kind of listen for those kind of things and you dismiss other things, uh, technologies as you go. But as you refine your taste over the years and get exposed more and more to other things, now I'm starting to really be at that level where 
I can appreciate these legendary designers, how they do actually separate themselves, why they are legendary, what their designs are really accomplishing, and get another level of refinement to my own taste profile such that you know, Earl Geddes with the Infigo, uh, Alusio Room, Duke Lejeune has always been a big fan of the Earl Geddes uh, design and reverberant field and the way he toes in those speakers and designs the speakers intentionally to be done, done that way. It doesn't mean you go with any speaker and do it that way, but those are designed to be that way. And now he's doing it at a cost, no object level. Those speakers are going to be probably 30,000, but still for many people, that'll be a steal compared to 50, $80,000 speakers. I've heard those were better. Um, you know, that room had no treatments. Now, could it have used treatments? I think when I played some stuff loud, uh, it could have benefited from treatment. But I think what he did was smart. Show that that room and the speakers with no treatments gave you high-end performance. And if you had treatments, it'll really just bring it up even more potentially. But also the key takeaway from that room and why it's one of my best of and, you know, set the bar higher than most others is, like I was saying, I was going to pay attention to setup. The subwoofer setup in there was impeccable. You had no clue the subs were even in the room. And there were four of them placed in the middle of the walls, both in front, behind, side. You could not tell. Extremely tough to do. Trust me, guys. Very tough to do. I hear subs. I'm very sensitive to that. And I even mentioned that in another room. I don't like it. I don't like to hear a sub ever. And even on my room, I had to spend a lot of effort to get that done. Uh, so to, for somebody to get it done like JR with Wally Tools, he comes up with this. And it's based on the Gettys method. He's got his own uh, proprietary process. He's going to come to Houston in January. We're going to put that swarm method in my room. Who knows? I may transition to that. Uh, certainly what he did was very impressive. And I'll share as much as I can or as much as he'll share with me with you guys. So stay tuned for that and subscribe if you haven't. But another designer that, again, legendary, Siegfried Linkwitz. Again, this guy is the godfather of crossovers and spent so much time uh, understanding speaker design. And when you listen to the Linkwitz, you realize how faulty many box speakers are. Not all box speakers, but the difference is so apparent once you get that refined level of looking, or at least you're sensitive to, I don't want to make it... Uh, that you're not refined if you don't like the Linkwitz, but there's just a shouty nature to all point source speakers that are box speakers especially. I hear the cabinet, the, all the violent interactions inside the cabinet come out either through the cabinet, through the drivers, or through the vent. So eventually, as you learn, that stuff gets audible. Um, what he's done with his open baffle speakers here, among many other things obviously, is not have a speaker that shouts at you. And that room was not even as good as the room in Seattle in terms of size and wow factor. But this is what you need to learn over time when you go into these rooms. Look at the room, look at the challenges they have, and then judge what they've done to uh, address that and give them props for how well they've done that and, and how well the product handles that. And so the seating position for was for the center seat where I was was super close to the speaker. Most point source box speakers would just shout at you. You would know that it's playing from a speaker. It could be sound good, could be flat, perfect, whatever. All these checkmark things that people like to say they they analyze a speaker on, but you still know you're listening to a speaker. What the Linkwitz did was they disappeared, and you let, felt like you were listening to a performance. And for my taste, that's the difference between high end and not high end. I mean, for me. I could get pro audio drivers to sound like a speaker and be flat and put high SPLs and check mark a bunch of boxes. But if a speaker transports me to I'm listening to the performer, they disappear and I don't hear the speakers as much. And it just in that presentation with Amy Winehouse using an MP3 uh, from YouTube. Great track, by the way, Back to Black, Amy Winehouse. You know, that's one of my favorites. Uh, her voice was actually behind the speakers, even though I was up close. So to me and my taste, I'm being transparent with my taste. You may not care about those things, but it's something I think you should listen for because as I've told people over the past, it Doug's one that's also, he's like, ever since you taught me about these speakers shouting at you, you know, that he became sensitive to it. So maybe I make people neurotic when they shouldn't be. But I think eventually, whether I tell you or you find it out on your own over time, that's something I think most people over time grow to appreciate more versus less. So kudos to Linkwitz and 
uh, another great room, one of my best as, as usual. Uh, the other one, obviously, is Andrew Jones, another legend in the business. And the, that interview was riveting. I encourage you to watch it because first blush, you look at this box speaker, paper cone driver, just a looks like a bookshelf, says $3,700 or whatever it is without even the stands. Like, hmm, is he just charging based on his name value? What could what could be into it? And is it made in China or whatever? Uh, what could it really be? Could it really be that good? Well, in many respects, number one, listen to that interview to understand all the R&D and how innovative it really is. The concentric driver and what he's done that nobody else has done before. The cabinet construction, two inches in the baffle for that price point. Unbelievable. But here's the other thing. You never see a speaker at that price point or most speakers in general point source box where you're. Parts cost is more in the driver than the cabinet. Usually with most box speakers, you're paying for the cabinet first. That's what's 50,000, 80,000. Guess what you're paying for? The finish and the cabinet. That's the biggest cost. Here, you're paying mostly for the drivers. You're not sacrificing anything for the cabinet and the baffle. It's two inches thick in the front, one inch around. It's got a, a unique curvature and the baffle has, um, curvatures to eliminate baffle reflections brilliant design cool framed out vintage look should fit into most homes but here to me is the thing people are overlooking with that speaker it is ideal for home theater because my big pet peeve i started this channel way back in the day when nobody was watching talking about home theater center channel speakers are the biggest problem in home theater because they never match even if a company says this model, this one turned on its side, is in the same family as the, your floor tent. No, it's not. Play pink noise from your receiver uh, or whatever, and you'll hear the difference just playing pink noise in the tonal balance. And that's a problem for me. I don't like that. Uh, I get around it here because I use a planer center that's similar to the planer here uh and then i make my center do very little such that that coloration and difference isn't uh but if you can get three identical speakers that's a huge advantage for home theater and then you can use those same ones in the rears which you do want to do because the more you have to a full range like these are or virtually full range is a huge benefit because you don't want to have to roll off stuff that super high to subs all the way across the room and have that tr challenge unless you have somebody like JR set it up for you. You don't want to have that challenge. So the best deal here, guys, is to buy five of those at least and set up a home theater that will kill just about everything. Now, let's not go overboard. He played a lot of great tracks and it showcased extremely good performance uh, throughout the frequency range. Visceral bass, those 10 inch drivers actually, you know, I was impressed because I have speakers with just 10 inch drivers and they, they do bass good, but this does even better. Uh, but when I did come back and play those exact same tracks on my system with two big subs, the it is this is going to be much more huger scale and that last octave at the bottom so let's not get it twisted it's not like the best speaker ever probably not even better than his tads that he had at 20k point way back in the day and i'm sure he's going to come out with something that's a next iteration of this uh as well but it's still in my mind one of the most perfect speakers ever made because for the most part it gets that 40 hertz bass right and that's what people are listening for that around that 40 hertz some people can get away with not wanting that 20 hertz. A lot of material doesn't even go down there. So, and that scale of like what I have here is not a big deal for most people. Uh, you, this, for the price point, performance, and the universal apl application to home theater, two channel, whatever you have, you got 3,700 bucks, or I think that's how much it is, buy those speakers. Uh, you're going to be well ahead of the curve. There are other ones that are in that mark, uh, same price point that I saw at the show that would be something to consider, like the uh, Alta Audio Alyssa. That was a very impressive bookshelf. Um, so it's not like, let's not go overboard. It's not the perfect speaker for everybody. Looks-wise, you may want something different like the Alyssa. Uh, so I'm giving you some other options that I think are competitors. But a safe recommendation now for me, or people on a budget, that want a universally great speaker that you could be happy with for the rest of your life, I think 90% of people will lo love that speaker. And 
with DSP or whatever you do with your room treatments and stuff like that, you can extract even more performance out of it or add a sub down the road, all kinds of things. So kudos to Andrew Jones. And so it's kind of funny that the three most legendary minds behind speakers are also my three favorite rooms from the show. But there were a lot of other great rooms too. Um, the normal suspects, the Von Schweikerts, the uh, Oz room with the Lanche speakers. Uh, with the tw plasma tweeter that was really nice uh, odyssey was back with their budget let's talk about some budget rooms that deserve kudos now the budget the odyssey room wasn't a budget room because he brought all of his symphonic line stuff that the, marked the price up acoustic signature turntable but if he would have brought his amps that are much more budget and a budget source i think the performance would have been in the same ballpark unfortunately i didn't have the center position to really get an appreciation but i've heard odyssey rooms forever decades he's been going to these shows and those speakers he produces at the six thousand ish price point floor stand is are definitely one of the budget um steals that you want to look for uh at that price point you definitely want to audition them or consider them as an option the other one that i think is my number one budget room in total was that dr um dc hi-fi had that dr speaker with um it had the mini DSP in it, but he, he also ran it with the hollow DAC and other crossovers. Um, the room wasn't the best room. He didn't have a lot of treatments in it. Uh, so, But if you played material relatively low and didn't excite certain room things, man, that was, if you blindfolded people, they would not think that those speakers, the show special was like $6,700. You never find a speaker with a raw ribbon tweeter at that price point. Somebody should take advantage of that. Because with Mini DSP and a room that you can put treatments in, that system that he put together, even with Crown Amps, you can even do something better than that or something aesthetically, even if you just want aesthetics, you can do something better and still be at a good price point. Man, that is going to be a killer system a lot of people like. So I try to keep my eye out for things that perform way above their price point, and that room was definitely one of them. Obviously, Salk is really good with their finish. They're another good budget room. There wasn't a ton of... The, the one, most peculiar thing is I went to SVS. They were always having a party up there, eating and drinking, and I, I couldn't even do their home theater demo. It just looked like nobody was really interested in doing anything except partying up there. So um, SVS, though, usually is a good budget room. It wasn't, as usual, these shows are being taken over by big dollar budget and big price tag total systems and wow factor in terms of aesthetics and all that because let's face it you're going to have a window to show people stuff that's what intrigues people but it's very important for you not to get sold on looks and all that stuff and also understand the challenges that each room has and who navigated the best now let me transition to other memorable things from the show and that goes to content because i give extra points for Rooms that not only have great sound, but choose great content. Because one of the variables is what content you hear in that room at the time. It's very primitive for people to go into a room, listen to maybe one song, if they even listen to the full song, come out and then make a judgment about that gear. Very primitive, guys. You want to get a, a level of sophistication over the years where you can go in there, not just listen to what you hear, but take note of everything going on in the room. And so a perfect example of this is that Songer Whammerdye room. He played the Tracy Chapman's uh, All That You Have Is Your Soul. And kudos to him because that's the best song that I heard played at the entire show in terms of a song I never hear. I love that song. Her best song, in my opinion. It's a brilliant song. Should have been a huge hit. I don't understand What's going on? When when she her voice is perfect for harmonica, and when that harmonica part comes in with with her voice, that is a brilliant song, brilliant lyrics. You know, I'm not saying it's like John Lennon Imagine, but the lyrics are extremely good and provocative, and you know, emotionally jarring for a lot of people. And I, you can even tell when she sings it, her eyes water. You can watch a um, a YouTube video with her. That's a great song. So kudos to Songer Whammerdine for bringing that song out. More room should take note play that song. And I did have the Infigo Alusio room play it later. And quite frankly, I think, here's a great point, the song or Whammerdyne, I think did that song a little bit better. Now the volume matching was different, but the room was, and the speaker needed a little bit better in the song or Whammerdyne for that particular song. But here's the point I'm making. 
when I next had the song of I Room do Oh Dear by Sophie Zalmani, guess what happened? There's a bass note in the beginning, and that's really all the things that are going on at the time in the song. All of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and it drops out to almost like mute. And I'm realizing that as that bass note is playing, once it hits a certain frequency, I'm in a null in the room, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing nothing because of cancellation. A null uh, happened. And so here's a song where it didn't excite that null, and I didn't notice it, and it was better than certain other rooms. But another song, it excited a null in the room, and then it wasn't that great at all. So, and then I just, but I just moved my head six inches, then all of a sudden it came back in. The bass didn't drop out. So, this is the level of sophistication you want to start trying to evolve to as you go to these shows. It took me decades to kind of learn this on my own because there wasn't anybody telling me this stuff. There aren't the, the Audiophile Press and other YouTubers and all this stuff. Well, there weren't even YouTubers back in the day. They don't, they just write down what their thoughts are after one song and do these things just for content and just for th their job. You know, this is something that you want to evolve to on your own if you can. But if you get a little bit of help, like I'm trying to give you, try to start paying attention to these things. If something sounds wrong, think of what could it be? What could it be that's making things sound wrong? No bass. Don't just leave the room saying, oh, those speakers have no bass, you know. And then the next show, you're going to be embarrassed because you're going to go in there and then the bass is going to be there. And you're like, why do the exact same gear have bass one time and not the other time? You know, you've got to put two and two together in this hobby uh, to start getting that level of sophistication. That'll save you time. As I mentioned in my series, mistakes that audio, fi audio files make, these are things that'll save you time, wasting time on gear and bad choices. So the other uh, content that I heard that was great was the Genesis Room. Gary Coe's great. The, that new Arnie Nudell tribute speaker, super dynamic. Um, we played my first concert ever I went to was Frankie Goes to Hollywood. He had that LP. So he asked me, what do you want to hear? We did it. He said, we'll turn it up to 130 dB. Man, those amps were at the max red. Uh, and thankfully, I hope it didn't overload the mic. I, I saw a comment. I haven't even watched my stuff yet, guys, uh, to know if it overloaded the mic or not. But that was a lot of fun. Uh, obviously the high end, my Oz room, always fun after hours, great content on those tapes, ELO, Queen, you know, that's killer stuff. I'm so bored with the stereotypical audiophile stuff that that's what I like to hear. Now there was some really good audiophile stuff, especially the demo that, um, Acora did debuting their new speaker, which is another standout room because that quartz with the white uh, with the black drivers look really sharp to me. That resonates with me uh, a lot. And I might get their amp stands if they have that in that color because it would go perfect with my amps and my color profile here. But uh, those were very impressive. But again, here's another case where you, what material are you listening to? When they're playing material like uh, I think Bill Evans Trio and the piano is so pure. This is a speaker that's a point source box that doesn't have a lot of the negative characteristics I associate with point source boxes and you can definitely tell it when it plays great material like pianos quartets and all that it can play the other stuff as well and as I showed at 3MA we played Cardi B and I think that alone helped to convince one customer to actually buy the speaker hearing it overhearing it but you know as a whole it depends on what you're listening to at the time what strengths it may showcase and uh there's a lot more to come from Acora, I'm sure, so stay tuned. That's a great company that's on the way up, and good to see that they're coming out with different finishes. Uh, again, kudos to those guys. Uh, I'm trying to think of everybody, anybody else that I need to definitely take you know, note of. It's, it's like so many that were good. I hate to make this where I have to list a bunch of names just to say names. Uh, I really want to keep it to those rooms in terms of what I just said, because those pop out to me as I'm doing this right now to you off the cuff. But I didn't hear any rooms that were bad. Yes, there were snafus with things being broken or companies that couldn't bring their latest models. I talked about the rhythm. Give them another chance because their new models are definitely worth listening to. Give the global guys another chance. That driver that was busted or whatever was going on, give them another chance. That's a definitely a good room that was great in Seattle. Give them another chance. The one that didn't know about the... Uh, rumble filter or had a cartridge that wasn't matched up well with the arm or whatever was causing those drivers to go like that. Give them another chance. Sometimes um, 
things just happen in the busyness of a show. It's not as easy as you think to set up these shows and do these presentations and think of everything all at the same time. So hopefully my coverage was fun for you guys. If so, sign up, subscribe, because I'm going to have plenty more soon.